All right, so let's talk about our search for habitable exoplanets and we'll build on the ideas of habitability that we already developed. So my question to you is, how would we actually know if a given exoplanet was habitable? What would we hope to be able to measure about such a planet? Yeah, so we'd hope that we could figure out if a planet was in its habitable zone of its star. Um, maybe it would be nice if it had a size or density or mass similar to Earth, or at least be terrestrial. Uh, you hopefully be able to find water and an atmosphere. And so those are all different things that we could look for at a distance, right? So the habitable zone in general is defined as the place where liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet um, given the temperature of its star. So the, the size and location of the, of the habitable zone is going to depend on the star's temperature, right? Uh, but it could also depend on whether or not the planet has an atmosphere. All right, so um, the star temperature is the first and probably most important piece to figuring out this habitable zone. And we really want to um, meet these two criteria for a given planet, right? We want water to be liquid on the surface. So we want a star that's warm enough to provide for that in some region around it. Um, but we also don't want too much harsh radiation. And this is a problem for certain types of stars that are either, you know, farther along in their life process that they are producing a lot of harsh radiation or they're so young that they put out a lot of ultraviolet light. So um, the very largest, most massive stars are very short lived. And so even though you maybe could have a habitable zone around those stars, it wouldn't be a very smart place to look because there's probably not enough time for life to evolve on the planets around those large um, high mass stars. And then the small mass stars um, like the uh, red dwarf stars, those have a really small habitable zone because they have a, a very low temperature and low luminosity. And also they tend to have a lot of violent surface activity, which is not great uh, for life. So we tend to think that we would be most likely to find habitable planets in mid-range mass stars. Um, so if you took 122, the A, F, G, and K type stars are what we consider to be sort of the, the just right stars. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be habitable planets around other types of stars like M type stars, but it does mean that um, we would be a little bit more suspect that life would be wiped out by the radiation from them. All right, so you can kind of think of the ha um, habitable zone as a Goldilocks zone where it's not too hot. So you, it's, it's not too close to the star to be, you know, like mercury, extremely hot or too far from the star so that water is always frozen. And then the size of this habitable zone, kind of the thickness of these rings that we're seeing here, um, that's determined by the temperature and the luminosity of the star, but also that can be wider or narrower if the planet has an atmosphere or doesn't have an atmosphere. So if a planet has an atmosphere, maybe the habitable zone stretches, the outer edge stretches farther into space, right? All right. Um, another factor that's not often considered is the location of a star in the galaxy. Because if you want to be protected from harsh radiation, you would do well to avoid galactic center, right? So if you're too close to the center, there's going to be too much radiation. And also there's um, higher density of stars there. So you're more likely to um, be the victim of a stellar collision if you're near galactic center. Whereas out here in the spiral arms, um, the star densities are quite low. And so we are comfortably far from our neighbors. Um, there's another problem though, if you go too far from galactic center, there are fewer heavy elements around, so you can't form chemistries that would support life. So there's this idea of a galactic habitable zone in addition to the stellar habitable zone. But for the most part, we consider it a stellar habitable zone. All right, um, the third piece that we could consider for habitable planets is whether or not the planet has a stable orbit. So I think, what is it, Tatooine? in Star Wars that has a, a two sun system. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't actually watch Star Wars. I'm, I shouldn't tell you that. Um, but if, if you have two stars, there's a couple different ways that you could actually orbit that star. You could orbit both stars, 
right? So the planet could be in an outside orbit, or you could kind of um, orbit, have a stable kind of figure eight orbit between the two stars. And, you know, some of these might be, if you don't have a stable orbit, right, the figure eight is less stable than the other options. Um, you could be gravitationally perturbed and um, possibly be flung off into space or have your orbit moved. If your orbit moves, like the orbital distance moves while life is evolving, well, conditions have now changed. So now life either has to adjust or maybe it gets wiped out. All right, so those are a few factors for habitable planets. Um, so these are the types of things we'd want to observe from a distance, right? We're not gonna get close enough to the planets to actually measure their surface temperatures, but at least we could say we know the temperature of the star, we know how far the planet is, and therefore we can deduce whether or not there could be liquid on its surface. Um, other things like measuring the atmosphere, you could do with spectroscopy. Um, actually, this point is a really good point. So even in single star systems, if you have very massive outer planets like our Jupiter and Saturn, that can help to shield the inner planets from debris in the early stages of solar system formation. And that can also help to keep the orbits of the inner planets stable. So um, it's nice that we have Jupiter and Saturn for that reason. Okay, so what can we actually measure when we're looking at exoplanets? Um, they're usually too far away for us to measure their orbital distances directly by actually, you know, resolving their motion in a telescope, but we can definitely measure their periods using the Doppler shift. Um, and by applying their um, periods and their orbital radius, we can find their mass, the mass of the stars. This M would be the mass of the star plus the mass of the planet. Um, so we can find if we know the mass of the star independently due to knowing its temperature, then we can deduce the mass of the planet. So this is by no means simple. In 121, I think we did an activity where you went through and calculated whether or not planets were in their habitable zones. Um, we're not gonna repeat that here, um, but suffice it to say that what we're doing is measuring essentially orbital periods. Okay, so NASA's Kepler mission has been busy looking for habitable planets. And so that's why all the ones in, well, this is specifically about Kepler habitable zone planets, but they're named after they, how they're found. And then they have a number and a letter that did um, just shows, you know, I think it's related to the order in which they were found. Um, so you can look through an entire catalog of exoplanets and look for all of their orbital characteristics temperatures and whether or not um, researchers think that they're in the habitable zone. There's also another mission called TESS, um, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, I think. Um, that's also in the works right now. It's, it's actually in orbit. It's looking for exoplanets currently as well. So when we think about what types of life we might expect to find on exoplanets, um, it's kind of up to your imagination. Right. So we can think of biospheres here as being, you know, life on the surface or life in the oceans, but the atmosphere could be part of the biosphere too, right? You can have living things that are restricted to only living in their atmospheres. And since biology is really influenced by environment, then we can study Earth's biodiversity to give us clues as to what we might imagine could exist on other exoplanets. And I think this show Alien Worlds on Netflix actually does a pretty good job of showing the properties of a given star and planet. So these are real exoplanets that it's considering in, in Alien Worlds. It tells you the properties of the star, the properties of the planet, and then starts to try to imagine what could biology on that planet look like. Um, and I mean, it's very imaginative, but it is also related to uh, real world research. So if you're interested in things like um, ecology and geology, then Alien Worlds has science for you. Not, I'm not uh, being paid to advertise for this show, I just enjoy it. 